Thoth Hermes podcast. Welcome to the world of the Western esoteric tradition. Hello, friends and listeners. Welcome to yet another new episode of the Thos Hermes podcast. Today is November 3rd, 2019. My name is Rudolf and I am your host. I hope you had a nice Sawn, Halloween, Hello Tide, or whatever name you give to those special days when the wheel between the worlds are thin as never ever throughout the year. Today's episode is again what we call a regular episode here, episode 11 of season 3 to be precise, and it brings to you an extensive interview with an important personality from the world of the Western esoteric tradition. Our guest today will be Nick Farrell. But before we go there, let me especially welcome all those of you who are new to our podcast. I hope you will return very often. You can find this show on our website www.thoughthermes.com that is T-H-O-T-H-E-R-M-E-S dot com. But of course also on all the major podcast outlets like Apple Podcasts, Stitcher, Spreaker, Spotify, Google Podcasts, Android, iHeartRadio and many others. Given that lately we had some problems with our RSS feeds, I would have a request. If you experience any problems on your podcast provider in finding all of our episodes, please let me know by sending me a message on Facebook, Twitter, or via email on info at thoughtshermes.com. That will help me to be able to verify and see what's happening. It's impossible for me to do verify all services constantly by myself, so please help me with that. Normally, all 40 episodes should be available on all providers. If that were not the case, let me know. But... I'm of course also happy about all other kind of feedback and for your ideas. So do get in touch through the means I just told you or also by a message from our website, either on voicemail or by using the contact page. I felt very flattered the other day when I received the following message from Gabrielle from Nova Scotia, Canada. She wrote, Hi Rudolf. You are magnificent in your role as interviewer and podcast host. I love the depth of your questions, probing and teasing at times and nudging the interviewees to express the depth of their personal explorations. I feel tickled and excited about each new episode as well as the specials, musical interludes and hints to go down the rabbit hole in the worldwide Spiderweb 4. It is like a magical radio show, entertaining and fun and with loving and joyful frequencies sprawling. Please keep sharing your wonderful work and creativity. Wow, well, I do feel flattered. I know it is vain to read that, but I so like this message. Thanks, Gabrielle, for it. Now please go all and subscribe to the newsletter also from our website and then you will also see that Patreon button and the donate button on the home page. You know what it is for, don't you? Seriously, this podcast needs your support. I see through the ever-increasing number of downloads that Thoth Hermes is really liked by you, its audience. But unfortunately, it also costs a little bit of money to produce it. And the number of patrons on Patreon is not increasing in the same way. 
So, please, if you can help, click the Patreon button or go on the Patreon site and look for the Thought Hermes page. Become a patron. $2 per episode and you are one of them. And there are never more than three episodes per month that are charged, even if it should happen that there is a fourth. So thanks a lot for your support. And here comes a message from our sponsor. Anathema Publishing Limited. Quality occult books and contemporary esoterica. Established in 2011, Anathema Publishing aims to provide superior literature in content and form by creating a triune relationship between publisher, author and reader. Anathema Publishing produces refined books for the true bibliophile on topics ranging from Gnosticism, traditional craft, alchemy, hermeticism, witchcraft, to Luciferian philosophy. www.anathemapublishing.com As I said in the intro, today's guest is Nick Farrell. I had initially planned him for episode 10 already and then needed to change that and here we finally go. Nick is a great specialist of the occult and the esoteric worlds and he doesn't only know a lot but he has also a lot of practical experience. We are going to talk about all that in a minute but before it I would like to play some music for you as each time. This week's pieces are all from one band called the Butterfly Wheel. I discovered them when I prepared the episode on the Occulture Berlin Conference, which in fact took place this weekend. And I liked the music and asked them if I might play pieces by them and the Butterfly Wheel agreed. In fact, they are a duo of two ladies, Moon Child and Alice Ancient. They are based in London and they are creative expressionists specializing in site-specific performance and immersive theater. As it says on their website, the butterfly wheel unravel wisdom through their weaved songs and sounds. Theatrically and sensitively performing their attunements to the deep feminine, drawing on their inspirations from esoteric philosophy and their own core intuition. Their sound has been described as wildly intriguing and haunting. Okay then, get yourselves intrigued and haunted, judged by yourself now. The first piece we hear is called Sophia, the butterfly wheel.
Butterfly Wheel performing Sophia. And now we go and join Nick Farrell. Nick was born in the United Kingdom in 1965, but he moved at a very young age to New Zealand. And that had also a great impact on his later spiritual development. It is surprising to us over here to how big an influence New Zealand had, especially on the Golden Dawn worlds and development. We already heard about that a few episodes back in the interview with Ruba Fields Salsuere. Nick Farrell today lives in Rome, in Italy's capital. He has written numerous books and very interesting ones. We are going to talk about his approach to magic, his personal background and history, and why being a Leo is so good for doing ceremonial magic. Well, at least that is what Leos like Nick and I think. And there are many other highly interesting topics. As always, you will find background information and links in the show notes to this episode on the website. As usual, the interview will be split in half and in the little break, after just a bit over half an hour, we will listen to another piece by the Butterfly Wheel. Don't forget that you have chapter markers if your podcast player supports them, so you can jump right where you want to in this show. But now let's take our way to Italy and meet Nick Farrell. Here comes the interview. I am very happy to have a very interesting guest today in front of the microphone of the Thoughts Hermes podcast. And I would like to say welcome to Nick Farrell, who is speaking to us from Italy, I believe. Hello, Nick. Hi. It's great to have you. I've been uh, quite some time wanting to speak to you, and it's great that we finally are able to manage and to do that. Um, Nick, um, I just said you are in Italy now, but that's that's the actual state of a long story, <laughs> which has brought you into several continents of this world. Um, so I would like to start this interview by asking you a little bit how it all happened. So to speak, what brought you in regards to the Western esoteric tradition to who and what you are today, to the experiences you made and to what is dear to you today? How did Nick Farrell become Nick Farrell of 2019? It's a quite involved story, but... Um it starts a very and it starts a very very long time ago when I was seventeen and and looking for something beyond Christianity, and um, I realised that the Christian religion really was coming with a whole lot of baggage which I wasn't interested in, and I decided to find out something, find out what it was all about, what life was all about, what God was all about. And I could have gone into other religions, but really what happened was I found that occultism seemed to um, literally spring up at me and say, look at this, uh, try this. And within literally six months, I found myself in my first esoteric order and um, meeting um, what was then New Zealand's um, esoteric people. And from there found my way into uh, Golden Dawn types um, in New Zealand. But I think it was also tied with um, how I was changing too. And I was becoming, um, I was at that stage a journalist, uh, I was a training journalist. And then I went out to be a journalist in, in the big wide world. And that adventure tied in with my esoteric adventure because I suddenly decided to go to Britain to look for more esoteric people. And I thought it would be good to learn about how to be a writer in, in England. So I went to England and it was there. I was connected to the servants of the light, um, the group. And it was a, a bit of a renaissance time for them because it was the time when they were just setting up, um, their lodge system. So, and I, got to be um, close to uh, David Goddard, who was setting up for them. And I was really, really lucky because I picked up a lot of 
how to make magic practical as opposed to theoretical. And this was really, really important, as I discovered later, because when all that, um, the SOL experience dissolved in, in, in a great fireball, um, I then started thinking about the Golden Dawn people that I met in New Zealand. And I started to think, well, the lessons they were telling me then, perhaps I can apply now. And um, I was, I joined, I went over to America to do a series of workshops. Um, and I'd already met the Ciceros. So um, I was then initiated into what was the Hermetic Order of the Golden Dawn, went back to England and set up uh, a temple in Nottingham, which is still going. But um, it was everyone, everyone at the time, everyone in England told me it was impossible to do because there was a huge backlash against the Golden Dawn within England at the time. And the sort of Golden Dawn that was being presented to um, English people was the American, a very American form of Golden Dawn, which was, which came from Israel Regarde. It was heavily psychological. It was heavily um, uh, Protestant mechanical, uh, very Masonic. And what I tried to do was say, okay, there was this current that I'd met in Britain with SOL. Let's see if we can get them back together again. And what happened was I, there was a different type of golden dawn that created itself from that. Um, and it was working until um, I had my f um, five equals six grade within the golden dawn. And I had a very important experience with that ritual. And I really couldn't cope. Um, it was one of those situations where I describe it in my later books, where you encounter your higher genius through a ritual and you spend a long time processing it. And it, did, it took me seven years to process it. I literally just up sticked and moved to Bulgaria, um, which was a place I picked at random. Uh, and I lived there for seven years. And I was flying over to England to do initiations within the Golden Dawn, but my own personal work was limited to, I wrote a couple of books in the, in the, but I was really wanting that sort of isolation to process until I reached a point where suddenly I realized I wanted this to be my life. And my story was going to be a magical story. And however I tried to phrase it or try to adapt it or run away from it, it was really I needed to, I needed to live it. So I went back to England and discovered that that wasn't going to work um, because it just wasn't, there anymore um the people weren't there the situation wasn't there for me to be able to set something up in the way i wanted to and so i um moved to rome and set up the magical order of the aurora aria um that involved a big fight a big schism and everything else i mean i've written about sorts of stories because I, um, I read a book in, while well, I was in Bulgaria about how to set up an esoteric order. It was full of really good advice. I mean, I still think there was some really good stuff in there, but when I wrote it, I couldn't conceive of the problems happening to me. I can't, I can't look at that book without thinking, yeah, but that's, yeah, you, you hadn't really got enough experience to comment on these particular things at the time. And as an idea, it's the, the, the concept of groups, I think, still works. But I needed to do something myself with my own contacts, with my own magical um, connections. And so we set up MOA, and I went back to New Zealand to get married. And um, we met up with some of the Whare people again. 
and they we were talking and they were really really excited about what we were doing and they gave us their blessing if you like and so that that also changed things they said you know this is the system as we learned it you know that pretty well now it's time to try and see if you can make it adapt to the 21st century and use your ideas within that system and I was surprised at first because I always thought they were really conservative about how they saw the order, but apparently they weren't. And um, so we, the first thing I decided to look at was this idea of Christianity being the forefront of magic for the last 2000 years. And I wasn't really a Christian anymore. It wasn't really until I got to Rome that I really discovered this, that um, previously you could almost say I was agnostic because I didn't really know what to believe. But what happened in Rome was I started getting the pagan contacts of old Rome and through them the Greek ones and everything else. And it forced me to start looking at um, neo-Platonic ideas, pagan ideas in a 21st century context and then relate them back to the golden dawn. So what I did was trans, I didn't, I never ever have changed anything within the golden dawn system, but I have added things that bring in some of these ideas. So Moa is not, I would not say is connected to the, to the golden dawn, but it is connected to the Golden Dawn system as a branch of it. And um, I'm quite pleased with the differences we got because I think one of the problems I had with HOGD was sometimes I was doing these initiations and they weren't connecting. There were some things that were missing. And I think I found what they were and I was able to wire them back in. But that's, that's the story. Alongside that is my writing, which um, is part of, the magical side of things is that I started, I wanted to always write. I've always, I've been a journalist. I've always wanted to write and I can write quite simply. I mean, it's quite easy for me to write or it used to be. Um, so I was able to pour all that, all my ideas into different books. And some of them, um, I find encapsulate what I'm thinking um, and where I'm moving towards and, um, others are processing things like the golden dawn history or looking at existing systems and trying to make them, um, happen or look at them in a very conventional way. Those sorts of books are the ones I had most problems with because they're not me. They haven't got my experiences. They haven't got my experiments. They're more talking about other people's stuff, which is pretty subjective, but, when I'm writing my stuff, I feel quite happy. And the one, the books that I'm writing now are taking a lot, lot longer because they are also heavily experimental and looking at um, older systems and bringing them in and changing things and doing all sorts of things. And it's getting more and more away from the Golden Dawn, mm -hmm. but still using the Golden Dawn as that backbone. <laughs> Yeah, very many things seem until nowadays related to the Golden Dawn, but maybe we go into that a bit later. And I, I mean, I, I, I'm sure everybody who's listening is thinking the same. This is a very fascinating uh, life story when you talk about magic and all the experiences you were able to make. Also, not just um, content wise, but even geographically, and I'm sure because I personally believe that also the location where you are, of course, plays a certain role in how you perceive things and how they also work out on you. Um, so I don't know if you agree on that, but that's how I would see it. Um, so can we go maybe a little back, a little bit back into more detailed one or two or three of, the, of those locations where you were starting in New Zealand? You, you, are, you are, were born in the UK though, weren't you? 
Yeah. My, my dad um, moved us out there when I was six months old. Ah, okay, that early. Okay. So, um, but um, of course, the listeners here, they know a bit about all those things, but maybe not in enough detail. And I would ask you if you could uh, tell us a bit more about that New Zealand time. It, in co of course, involved the Order of the Golden Dawn, which everybody thought had been had had been dead after Israeli Gardi had died. And uh, then suddenly it came, I think it was Patrick Zalewski, if I don't, uh, if I'm not wrong, who revealed that there is still a Golden Dawn living and working in New Zealand at the time. Am I right in that? Uh, sort of. It doesn't exist anymore. It did actually close in 1978. Okay. But what happened was there were um, groups of former members who would still get together to meet. They wouldn't always do rituals. They did do rituals, but they didn't always. But mostly it was a way, because they'd been you know, meeting together for at that stage for about 50 years, they were all friends. They all knew each other. And so they would get together and they would have tea and biscuits and talk about occultism. And what you'll find is people like Pat and Chris Zaletsky, who are very important to the story, um, and also um, Tony Fuller, um, who was another person who, who found another group based around, centered around Frank Salt, um, and this is one way that they were able to give this old style of te this old teaching back to a, a younger generation. And we were really young. And one of the problems I think um, with me was if I look at it now, I just there are trillions of questions I would ask them um, now, which I wouldn't have, uh, which I couldn't think of at the time, which is a bit sad, but. Um, a lot of the magic I learned um, from they, they would say things and I, I would store it. I mean, um, one of my, t uh, David Goddard once said to me, um, I, I, had, I had a tendency to remember things because I'm a journalist, but I also tend to remember teachings. Mm -hmm. I'm really good at it. And I could actually quote people of what they said of a teaching was decades ago. Okay. Um, and David Goddard once said to me, if you love me, don't quote me. So I always quote him. <laughs> but the, point, the point is, is I can remember what people said at that time really, really clearly. And so some of these stories that I have, I can remember the stories they told me. And, okay, once I actually had run, ran an occult group, uh, actually a Golden Dawn occult group, I started to understand some of the more obscure things they said. And it was only when actually under um, Aurora Aria, because I wasn't really aware of it until, like, for example, there's something daft about where you position the pillars and when the hierophant comes through them and stuff like that. Really tough stuff. But I can remember someone talking about that, but I didn't equate the two until I actually encountered the problem. And um, that was quite interesting so i started applying what i could remember and then hopefully some but there's a whole lot of stuff that was lost pat and chris got a lot of other material um because they were around hawks bay a lot longer than i was before um everybody basically just started dying um i had a couple of people who were really good at what they taught me and um It was, it was, I was lucky again. If, if anybody says this about me, um, I've been really lucky with the teachers and the groups that I've had. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I had the right people at the right time. I mean, I went over to England. I first met um, Marion Green, who introduced me to another person who introduced me to another. And soon I got this network of people who gave me some really good information and experiences. Um, so it's, it, it, it is fundamentally lucky. So that golden dawn experience was tremendously lucky because they were not going to be alive much longer. I mean, in the, seven, the order actually closed in 1978. They were pretty old even then. Um, I mean, my teacher got his five, six in 
1948, I think. So you're talking quite a long, long time and um, of doing magic. And it, they had also got some very interesting views. And some of those interesting views, for example, um, Percy Wilkinson, who was a big help to me, he told me he was a 6'5", which is a very high grade. There's only there's a 7'4", which is straight above it. And then there are some more obscure ones later on that very few people could tell you about. I said to him, why, why are we, you're in the order for, you're a 6'5", for what, 30 years. Why didn't you go to 7'4"? And he said, because the 7'4 was about mysticism. And I had no interest in mysticism. Mm -hmm. And that's how it worked. Um, the, an order will unlock various things in you. So the 5-6 the, um, teaches you how to be um, a baby magician. You get your wands, you get all your teaching, and you bring it all together. The 5 is about being practical on a more macrocosmic level, practical magic. And then in the 7-4, you start looking at your own mystical relationship with God and the higher genius. And I think Percy got it wrong, um, to be fair. The 7-4 isn't quite that. The ritual itself is like that, but actually the 7-4 is about making your own contact to be able to teach um, and also to develop your own spirituality enough to start getting into the more abstract forms of magic and also consciousness. So I think he might have had more fun in the seventh floor than he thought, but these were ideas that they taught. And I think um, people forget that. They tend to think an order is an order and it's an established thing where A goes to B, goes to C, goes to D, and it isn't. What happens at the five, six, you're given some information, you're given training and everything else. You become a more experienced magician and then you're on your own, sort of, but you've got friends around you who you can share information with. And that's one of the reasons why I think most people have difficulty with me is that I don't, I tend to talk in absolutes. It's a triple Leo problem and that I tend to say it's like this, but I may not believe that next week. Right. If, if I've got some more information or, or an experiment comes up and it, I'm able to prove that it is something different. So all the things I believe, say, in 1990 when I arrived in England, lots of them have gone. Things like reincarnation, which was a big thing for uh, SOL and the unfortune, which I don't believe in anymore. And so little things, little things like that, which were at the time were told were huge things, turn out not to be particularly important. And so when I'm looking at things like Solomonic magic, um, you say, okay, Solomonic magic's pure Christian approach. But no, it isn't. Because um, I can make it work in a, in a pagan approach as well. So all these sorts of things, when people say absolutes about the cult teaching, you know that they're not. It's not true. Because there is no literal occult teaching, a golden thread of pure teaching that stretches back to the dawn of time. There isn't. Yeah. It's about how you adapt these ideas into, into, a, into a life that's now and working now. I couldn't agree more. I mean, I'm absolutely with you and that, and I have made uh, quite a number of personal experiences of that kind as well in that field. And um, I think, and when I say that, this is at the same time a question to you, if you, if you see it the same way, or if you have a different view on that, and um, that is also um, the reason why say a golden dawn or another order, but let's take the golden dawn in the late 19th century must be different than a golden dawn order in the early 21st century because people, history, um, the world and all that influences the world and therefore also the, the men and women in the order has changed. Would you agree on that or how, how is your point of view on that? I think it's quite funny because one of the biggest problems um, I think the Golden Dawn has is with its um, 
current of what I call fundamentalism, where they believe that if you've got a paper, usually a photocopy, of an original manuscript written by Mathers, it has somehow some divine province that because Mathers wrote this to describe a ritual that he did, we have to do it the same way. And I think because I've lived in different countries and I've also seen how language changes, Mm -hmm. um, you can see how, um, take for example, Italians. Italians have a very dramatic way of speaking with very, very long sentences. The structurally it's, they want to be what in English we'd call purple, but it's much more expanding, like you're talking to a large audience. Now, Victorian stuff was similar because the Victorian books before television, you used to read books. So you can't really use short, clear, punchy sentences like a journalist would use because you're speaking to an audience. So books like... Um, uh, Butler Lytton and all those sorts of Victorian books were all very, very long and pompous. And that same thing applies, that same mentality applies to the Golden Dawn. Um, and also, if you know how the Golden Dawn wrote, you can start seeing a pattern. For example, the Golden Dawn would write a piece of paper. It would be a single A4 sheet, say, which was supposed to be copied out by the students. But it's only a starter. It's not the whole thing. And it might be a very good paper. It might be very detailed, but it doesn't hold you. An ordinary person could pick it up and read it and not understand a word of it Um, because it's supposed to be a starter to get you thinking. And that seed that they, that Mathis was writing didn't have to be very long. It just say, give you a little bit of a push so that you could then build it into your sphere of sensation, your universe and do something with it. So when you have these heavy structures within the Golden Dawn, you know that they're only training. So at a certain point, you can walk away from them. Um, If you've ever sat through a a ritual, a Golden Dawn ritual, um, uh, a Z document, they're called Z document rituals. You learn them in the six, and they're basic. They give you the structure of the ritual to follow using the Nort Nort. Um, initiation ritual brilliant idea really good on talismans I mean it's a very clever idea Um, however it does make the rituals a little long um, and it it doesn't apply to all rituals you can't apply it to all rituals so for example the golden dawn would not have had a healing ritual if it was dependent on the Z documents because there isn't one and you could, you'd be hard pressed to get a healing ritual into the Z formula. Um, but the Golden Dawn did have healing rituals. Also, another problem people have with the Golden Dawn rituals is uh, a little bit of history. People assume that Golden Dawn rituals are very long and involved. In actual fact, they're about the same length as modern rituals. But Because if you look at the Golden Dawn book, which was written by Regarde, you see his take on the Z documents. And he does rituals like personal transformation, invisibility, all these things. And he's written these rituals, which he thinks are brilliant, because he he used his rituals um, to pass his exam with the Bristol Temple of the Golden Dawn. Now, everyone thinks the Golden Dawn wrote like that, and I have done those rituals, and they are dire. Um, in fact, I remember once I did the, um, I did an invocation to um, a higher genius or something that was from the book, and my higher genius came in, took over, flipped over two pages and said, I'm not reading this crap. <laughs> because Riccardi would go on and on and on and on and because that's what he thought was good. And at the time, I've, I've discovered Bristol Temple thought his rituals were a little bit purple and over the top. Mm-hmm. Um, so for years, people have been doing these rituals thinking they're Golden Dawn rituals and they're not. Mm-hmm. Uh, the Zed document one's you can do in about half the time um, and still have the effect that you need if you've got the right, the great. But yes, people are different. 
Um, students are different, so they respond differently to training. Um, I mean, a Golden Dawn student would, for example, have a would be told to write out the material. It would be checked, and then they, there's no photocopying. They would take the document, write it out, give it back, and then you'd be tested on it. And um, uh, they, most modern people have real big difficulties picking up a biro. In fact, this is the one thing I've done, um, which is anachronistic. In Moa, what we do is we do exactly the same thing. Uh, I, 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 what happened was I found I was giving out big piles of papers, uh, photocopies of papers, um, to students who weren't even reading them. They were then cramming the test. So they knew what they had to do to pass the test, so they just read the test, memorize that, and pass the test. But all the other papers were never getting read. So what I did was I said, we'll go back to what the Golden Dawn did and make you write this stuff out. So at least I know that you know it, you've seen it, that you've read it. Because modern people are just used to going to the internet. I need a piece of information, go to the internet and do it. But that isn't inside your sphere of sensation. It's not changed you. It's not done anything. So you have to interact with the teaching. So that was one way I found of doing it. But um, other stuff is less important. The idea of secrecy, for example, is not what it was. Um, the idea of um, absolute power from the chiefs isn't what it was. I mean, I put up with a lot of shit from students because but I'm okay with that because I think it's fair enough. Um, when I was a student, I was a lot more, um, not a door. I, I, I sat and listened, um, a lot more than students do today, but I'd also ask questions and I think that's the way it has to be. But nowadays you get people who want to show you how clever they are and they will talk to some teacher who's been working on this stuff for decades, knows it backwards, but this student who's read a, read a book of something will just want to tell them, show how clever they are because they've searched up something on Wikipedia. <laughs> and the stuff is that... I think is one of the reasons why occultism is not quite as good as it used to be. Uh, yeah. Yeah. This is, this is too accessible, too much information, um, accessibility and not enough actual doing. And I think this is one of, I think it'll settle down. I think it'll reach a point where people will suddenly realize, Hey, yeah, we don't really know anything. Um, all these experiences we're having aren't really magical experiences. They're just me convincing myself that I'm seeing stuff when I haven't really, and I'm trying to tell people I'm having these experiences. Um, and they're not, you know, they're not because, you know, they don't disappear for seven years to Bulgaria or they don't, these, they don't have these experiences. They don't, it hasn't changed them at all. And I think that's where people have got, um, the problem they think um, they can approach it like a religion where they dress an altar to a, um, a voodoo saint or whatever and say prayers to it and um, that somehow makes them a magician but that's the absolute absolute opposite of what a magician is Absolutely. a magician is someone who talks to the god mm -hmm. uh, in fact I think if I had to recommend anybody a book that shows the relationship between gods and magicians, it will be the Terry Pratchett series. Oh, really? Mm -hmm. Because I think Terry Pratchett is the only one who's actually worked out that magicians and witches and magical people shouldn't really be worshipping gods. You sometimes do if you're wanting to get closer to them so that you can use, use the, the thing so that you can work closer with them. But you're not you're not forming a relationship with them. You don't pray to them. Um, and I think um, this is one of the biggest issues because they're all manifestations of the one thing. So 
um, worshipping a god is the same as worshipping a human. They're, they're both humans and gods are aspect of the one thing. We're all one thing. So worshipping a god, worshipping a human seems largely pointless um, because you're worshipping yourself. But you can use those mental tricks of, of religion to do your magic and to interact with these forces. I'm not saying these gods aren't real because they are, but how you're experiencing them, um, I don't believe that they're sitting around waiting to be told how wonderful they are. <laughs> yeah. No, that, that, that is really fascinating what you're saying here, because um, in a way, now this brings us a bit away from the Golden Dawn and I want to come back to it afterwards, but um, that's what I always feel uh, awkward about uh, Thelema and, and the Crowley uh, side, always talking about the true will. And yes, of course, that's something that I really think is extremely important. And at the same time, um, having a Gnostic mass and having a church and all of that, you know, um, f to me, even the wording is contradictionary. <laughs> yeah, I think that I think uh, I'm always amazed how people um, they get into occultism. The first thing they want to do is call themselves a reverend. Exactly. <laughs> uh, yeah. Why? Yeah. Uh, one of the issues I have with Salima, I don't have a. I mean, generally, I, I go on and off Crowley because I think some of the stuff he did was really good. And oh, absolutely, absolutely. This. But um, one of the things I think he was trying to do was I think he was trying to get a stable income. And I think part of the structure of Philema is a very, very alternative Christian. I mean, I grew up in a fundamentalist Christian environment, so I know exactly the sorts of words they use. And all this sort of, it has to be like this, da-da-da-da-da, uh, that is very, very Christian. I think it comes from Crowley's own Christian upbringing. Absolutely, certainly. So, I don't, again, I don't have a problem with Crowley as much as I used to have. I mean, I used to think, you know, he was complete, completely off the wall. But there are some things I think he, he got right. And I suppose after a year of esoteric living, uh, after years of esoteric living, he was going to eventually anyway. But I don't see him as the occult messiah or the occult Satan either. Yeah, no, absolutely. I, I am completely with you. Thank you, Nick, for the first part of our interview. So off we go for our musical break. And I bring you back Moonchild and Alice Ancient in their band called The Butterfly Wheel with another of their pieces they offered me to play on this show. This one is called Flame.
the Butterfly Wheel, female duo from London, performing their song Flame. Also on the website on the episode page, you will find links and information about our musical program and the artists if you're interested. Back to Nick Farrell now. We'll still have a lot to talk about. Towards the end also, especially about his new work, Helios Unbound, which I have the pleasure to be one of 100 selected to have a preprint of that book. And the final release will happen early in 2020. A very interesting seven-month course or workshop into a pagan Greco-Roman version of Golden Dawn-influenced ceremonial magic and personal development. Immediately after the end of our interview, the third musical piece of today will play, again by the Butterfly Wheel, and this one goes by the name of Laugh and Psyche. But first, here comes Nick Farrell. I want to bring you back on two spots in your biography back again, because always from there we spread out into uh, very interesting talks, and I think that's, that's a good way to do it. Um, what time, what year approximately were you going back to Great Britain and joining uh, the Servants of the Light? When, when was that? I joined the SOL just before I left New Zealand because it was a correspondence course. Okay. I left, in 19, uh, left New Zealand in 1989. Um, and it was through um, somebody, um, I was also connected to BOCA in New Zealand, but um, I'd largely fallen out with them. But the... Um, when I went there, I met um, David Goddard, who was also a member of SOL at the time, but had his own little group, and he was doing ex what I call experimental magic because it was new and interesting, and they were doing lots and lots of weird things. And his background was Wicca, um, Alexandrian Wicca, and but he had adopted um, the SOL system of ritual and I learned a lot doing that and I also learned what not to do in, in some cases as well so I had some really good stories from that that time um, and a lot of experience from that time I think because when I came to I could see the same problems or the same good things coming uh, later on and, and when I started to apply this this sort of stuff to the, to the GD Mm -hmm. Interesting, because the, the, the Wiccan input is something, I wouldn't call it the Wiccan input myself uh, in that respect, but um, let's say the, the natural input is something that sometimes I miss in those traditional Golden Dawn currents when you have the impression it's high magic, uh, completely cut off from what the world actually is. I'm exaggerating, uh, I know, but... Um, that's, that's, a, that's a problem of perception because I don't... Um, having seen both, and I've done Wiccan stuff as well, and shamanic stuff. I mean, I wrote, I wrote a book on shame and stuff. But um, I think that what we are looking at there is you have different degrees of vision magic and you have ceremonial magic and then you have this halfway house and ceremonial magic can be really, really bad, where you believe that you just do the ritual perfectly and the ritual will work. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. That's mm -hmm. why I call it a Masonic thing, because it doesn't. Uh, anybody who tells you you can pick up a book, read a ritual um, without any visualization, without path working, without, is lying. Um, that's one of the reasons why I didn't last very long in masonry, because it was just doing the ritual. And I didn't, didn't, I was looking, I was picking up psycho, psychic experiences and the things, but no one else was. Um, and I think when you have um, a ritual, it has to be on four layers. You need the ceremonial done right. You need the astral, the visualization stuff done right. And then you need the spiritual stuff on top of it. So it has this nice layered approach um, to a ritual that, um, most people don't get. They think you've got to have one or the other. So you'll find, in particularly in Britain, people who think ceremonial is wrong because they have long invocations and long rituals, which they don't need because they can sit away and sit in the astral and visualize stuff, and they don't need all this stuff. Mm -hmm. or something. Mm -hmm. But what happens is 
I don't think that magic earths itself properly. I think it tends to make, which is what I saw in SOL, very, very flaky um, people who aren't very practical but believe they're practical because on the astral they're so important. Um, because they'll encounter some god who says they're important and, it, oh, it's, it's wonderful. Yes, you're doing all this really good stuff, but it's all in your head. If there's nothing that's happening on the material level, then you can forget it. And, I mean, I've gone into lately, uh, well, the last few years at least, I've started looking at hoodoo um, because, not because I want to do hoodoo, but because it has symbols that are really useful at earthing the other stuff. So, for example, in hoodoo, you'd light a candle that's got these herbs in it, and that would be the centerpiece of your ritual. And then um, you don't do anything else in hoodoo, which is, well, I don't th I think that's a waste of time anyway, but people swear by it. But if you do that, um, and you then invoke, and then you put this astral level over it, and you then invoke these divine things on it, you've got this perfect four-level approach to a ritual which needs to be there and i think people think ceremonial is bad but really it's because if you do a ritual from the from mathis key of solomon um and do the long prayers the long psalms and everything else uh light all the incense do all the instructions as it's as it's written you won't get anything mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. but if you do that place an astral level over it um, open yourself um, psychically to experience that thing. You then call these forces down into the astral and then into the physical. You get what you're after. And I think this is, this is one of the things that's missed. I don't find um, ceremonial dry at all. Uh, again, it's a Leo thing. I think if I'm doing ritual, I like to perform. But at the same time, I don't think that that's, that's all of it. Oh, right. I think you have to get these other levels in there at the same time. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I had to laugh because you said it's a Leo thing. You're a Leo by sign, are you? Oh, yeah. Yes, yes. Me, me too. And I exactly understand what you mean. Performing in ritual is so nice. I, I enjoy it as well. <laughs> I, I started out like, I mean, I was going to be an actor. All um, oh, right. Right. I am actually. In New Zealand. I was, yeah. was going to be an actor and I was, I also was thinking about doing radio journalism or right. TV journalism. Right. But, um, in the end, uh, I preferred to eat. And so the idea of being an actor in New Zealand before Lord of the Rings or even Xena yeah. or these other things, you were going to starve. Yeah. And I didn't think I wanted to starve for my art. So I thought uh, journalism um, would be a better way forward. But I did. A, I went to drama schools, um, you know, part-time drama schools as a kid. And I did a lot of um, acting, most acting, most performance art in New Zealand at that time was amateur dramatics. It's pretty good. So I did learn how to speak properly on stage. And, but what I found was when I went to, um, England, um, I, and I was doing all this ritual stuff. I suddenly didn't need the acting anymore. It was like, I don't need to do this. And also the fact I really did not want to stand up on a stage and do a fake English accent in front of English people uh, because I, I thought I had a stronger Kiwi accent than I actually have. I didn't think I could get rid of it that easily because when, the way I used to act was, and I, I still do this with God forms, is I get into the character And I will sometimes lose control of certain aspects, like I should be, I should be holding this accent. I think the character becomes more important. So the same thing applied to, to rituals. Mm -hmm. Now, I have, I have one very particular question. You were mentioning several times now while we were speaking, the higher genius. Right. And mm -hmm. um, now, honestly, maybe maybe this is me, but I haven't heard except you, many other people speaking about this entity, let's call it that way, being the higher genius. It's, it's the HGA, the famous uh, guardian angel and whatever, but higher genius. Um, where do you take that term from and why do you use it? I, I would really be interested in you to develop a bit on that. 
okay, the higher genius is um, all humans um, have are connected to a single one thing. But the higher spiritual self is the part of the human, um, the divine spark that indwells inside you. It's not your holy guardian angel. That's a different entity. It's your high, what um, Jung called your higher self. Higher self, yeah. Hmm. Also, it's, it's got an ancient connection, and it also comes from the golden dawn. They talk about your genius standing before the throne of God. But it goes right the way back to ancient Rome. And the, before anyone started talking about holy guardian angels, they were talking about the high genius because it was a much more important being. Um, if you, the more you work on yourself, the, you, the more you contact your higher genius. Um, your higher genius is the part that's decided to incarnate in your life, to experience the universe through you and your personality. So your unique personality, body, everything is all part of your higher genius's plot um, in its story. It wants to experience creation so that it can understand itself. Mm -hmm. And um, my theory is, is that essentially the higher genius is chaotic. Like God, God is chaos. Mm -hmm. But it, needs to, it can't understand itself being chaotic so it creates a world of order and that we live in this world of order so we're beings of chaos living in this world of order and the higher genius is that force that consciousness that comes from the original god and is experiencing itself it's the first line of, of divinity that a person really makes now when you encounter your higher genius, you then realize what you are, what your destiny is, how destiny works, how um, it's not a, it doesn't, it doesn't often talk to you. People talk about the Holy Guardian Angel. It's supposed to talk to you. It's supposed to guide you and all this sort of stuff. But the higher genius is you. Mm -hmm. It's just the bit of you that you've forgotten about. Mm -hmm. And when, um, by, because you when you incarnate, you get lost in the movie of reality. Um, reality is all around you. This is what Plato referred to as the shadows on the cave. You become so lost in that narrative, that story that you forget who you are and what you're doing there. Once, once you've contacted your higher genius, you remember. And once you remember some things become more important and other things don't. Mm -hmm. and, um, all, I would say all magic, and this is a definitive thing, all magicians need to have a higher genius experience before they can do any magic, any real magic. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And whereas I think the Abramelin stuff, which is where the idea of Holy Guardian Angel comes from, mm -hmm. corruption of another plat platonic being, and you can see these, this being is it's the force that is literally in your physical environment designed to protect you. And I think the two have been confused. Um, the Abramelin, for example, wanted people to talk to their holy guardian angel so that he could guide them to God or to their higher self, which is you know, fair enough. But it's not a very high level experience. Um, it doesn't ha it really isn't a high level experience. Um, if you want to, um, talk to your holy guardian angel, you say, say to yourself, I'm going to go for a walk. Um, on in the 10 minutes it takes from me to get from here to the supermarket, my holy guardian angel is going to give me a message about this problem I'm dealing with. You go out and you carefully watch as nature or your holy guardian angel talks to you through omens, through symbols or whatever. Um, and that is classically what Plato was using when he was describing his dominion or his holy guardian angel. So for example, he says um, he was going to leave the gymnasium one day and suddenly he had this feeling that he wasn't supposed to because his friends were going to arrive. So he sat and waited for them and they arrived. 
that was his holy guardian angel. Or sometimes it would say, uh, tell him not to cross this river because he'd have this feeling. Now, my holy guardian angel did the same thing when I was on a whitewater rafting trip. I can remember going because there was a big waterfall we were going to go over and me and a friend looked at that waterfall beforehand and I knew that if I was in the boat, it was going to go over. It was an absolute certainty. I could almost see um, death sharpening a scythe um, over this um, over this waterfall, and I said, mm-hmm. "I'm not going to do it." And I was really aware of it. That was, um, and sure enough, what happens was I sat and watched the boat. The boat didn't go over, but if I had been sitting on the back where I had been. Mm-hmm. It would have. It would have. Okay. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Um, so I think but the two experiences are completely different. Whereas a higher genius experience is one where your personality is largely unimportant. You know, your personality is the car you ride in. It's it's the lamp. It's supposed to be broken. It's supposed to be colored in a particular way through all these weird experiences you had with your family and everything else. Mm-hmm. Higher genius has chosen that. So one of of the things that is quite weird is when you have had a higher genius experience, you don't become a better person. You become more yourself and more yourself. In my case, I remember I I had this experience and um, I was unable to stop certain things, which saying certain things has been with me ever since. But if somebody would say something silly or funny, I would have to either make a joke Mm. or say something about it, that it was right or wrong or whatever. That's a Leo. (laughs) Yeah, it's 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 pure Leo, exactly. The point was, a part of me would never have done that because it wasn't, I thought, no, no, I shouldn't be, shouldn't be these things. Um, And it's got me into a lot of trouble. I mean, people think I'm a particular person. I don't think I really am that person, but it's okay. The higher genius has worked that into the fact of that into the equation. So I will meet people and piss them off, mm-hmm. meet people and they will be my friends and it all works. And when I die, I, um, the higher genius in me withdraws and does whatever it wants to do next. Um, I think, probably it's learned something from my life or it's done something in my life. And and that's slightly different from the Holy Guardian Angel. Absolutely. Absolutely. Is the higher genius, if I get it right, doesn't have a quality. It's no good or bad. It is, it is, it is, it is what it is. Right. Right. God is neither good or bad. I yeah. mean, there is no... Exactly. Thing. Well, I'm with if you. Got, yeah. got yeah. One, one of the problems people don't get is if you've got one thing, there is, can be nothing else. The yeah. platonic idea of um, good and bad is... I mean, they talk about... Neoplatonics talk about the greater good and everything else, but it's a, it's a bit of a translation problem because if you've got one thing, it's above good and evil. And when you look at good and evil, good and evil are human qualities if you stop every aspect of the universe and i'm quoting terry pratchett here if you grind up the entire universe you wouldn't find a single atom of justice good evil bad or anything these things are entirely human concepts which help us understand the material universe but they're not. I, I, I have real problems with the concept of left hand, right hand paths, good and evil. They're not. Um, you know, I would not do. I would not do magic to harm somebody. But then, some magic. Um, most of the what I call black magic is done by good people thinking they're doing the right doing thing. The right thing, exactly. Yeah, yeah, absolutely, absolutely, absolutely. <laughs> I want to come before we we come to the end of that interview. I want to come to a point um, that uh, I'm lucky enough to know about because I'm one of hundred people who were able to acquire a preprint of a book that you are going to issue in a few months, I guess, which is called Helios Unbound and which is a the subtitle is Pagan Theory to Connect to Your Higher Genius. Just we are talking about that. And um, it is a, well, I would call it a six-month 
course, but that doesn't make it any justice. A six months guidance through a, a magical personal development and you, well, a, a really exciting new book that I'm, I'm really working at at the moment and it's very exciting. So uh, Nick, what brought you to, to write that? Can you say maybe a few words about it and when will it be released and what's the future of that, of that particular book and that course? The Helios was designed to be a magical boot camp. I mean, it was started out with the idea of, can I take um, uh, an entire magical system, which I'm working on, and stuff it into seven months so that somebody can be able to, to develop it themselves later on? Because there is, there is a, a call, for people want this sort of stuff. Um, and they're heading towards Abra Mellon or things like that. And they're not, some of them are getting what they want, some of them aren't. What I thought was, if I could take all the stuff, um, which probably would have been secret in the old days, and present it in a course, I could get the same effects that I got um, from doing a proper order. Um, and sort of you can i mean the goal is to contact your higher genius um what i did was all the experimental stuff and it took me years to write this thing because this is this again has a slight golden dawn framework it's yeah, mostly yeah. using greek and things like that mm -hmm. um, and uh the greek magical papyri and stuff and so i i didn't um uh I made a, a book that was something that I was doing and it was very, very personal. And initially I didn't want to release it. Okay. I had a huge problem with releasing it because it was pure um, original. And I mean, in the, if you go into internet world, you'll find people saying, oh, it's not um, we're not interested. This is, this is received our uh, personal gnosis is a phrase yet yeah, where you have, this is personal gnosis. This is not, yeah, but it isn't. It's based on all the Neoplatonic work. I did all the PGM work. I did all the ritual work. I did everything stuffed into a system for se over seven months with the goal of trying to get to your higher genius. And, um, I know it works because I did all these things and I also, I've had other people do these things. So when I wanted to see how it would go, um, and if it would be laughed out <laughs> because I just don't know. So I, I issued a hundred copies. I laid it out and issued a hundred copies of it. And the feedback was good. I got lots and lots of corrections I, I put in. I made a few things clearer where they needed to be made clearer. And I submitted it to a man, a man in press, which is Storm Constantine's publishing house, a cult. And she will put it out um, next year. I was, it was too big. I thought it was too big. Um, because it was the biggest book I'd ever written, something like 100, 140,000 words. And most occult books are 65,000. Um, and you couldn't split it so because it's a seven-month program. You know. Yeah, it's about 500 pages now in your, yeah. in your version, yeah. Mm. Yeah. So it's going to probably be a little bit smaller, but it's going to be mostly due to layout things. She didn't, she has so far hasn't said, I want to cut this. And I, don't, I, I think it's got a lot of experimental things in there, which I really like. And I'd be a bit disappointed if some if they, if they were cut. Well, maybe I, I may say that because you are the author. You, you of course say that. But I, as a reader, must say it would be a pity if, if they would cut out a few things because I, I wouldn't like to miss any of the chapters or, or even hints in there. They're really without think, wanting to compliment you, but it's really a great book and it just needs it all. I think when I, uh, what I thought might go was I get, tend to get a bit excited if I've got an idea um, about how things work. And one of the things that I got excited about when I wrote it was the idea of using geomancy to earth um, power. And um, I got really excited by it because I, I worked out how you could equate all these different things. And this is a GD talk sort of thing where you could, make all these things come together and earth them through planetary spirits and 
and geomantic spirits. Um, the goal of um, the Thergy is to use your astro uh, astrological chart to talk to the spirits that were in charge of your personality and life and develop them within your sphere of sensation so that you would become more and more like what your higher genius wanted you to be. So that when you do the final um, weekend retreat, um, it's really just a matter of, look, I've done all the work. Now I just want you to come and take over. Mm -hmm. That's mm -hmm. the idea. And, mm -hmm. um, and it, I mean, the rituals are done all have have worked in the, to do that. So what I've done, for example, in ch from chapter one to chapter seven, they all are uh, all rituals and exercises to continuously bang into you that your higher genius is part of your your life, your sphere of sensation, and how you should work with it. So after seven months, it is quite likely that your higher genius is going to just be able to start making those sorts of communications you need to do proper magic. I mean, I have got, there are two other books on the cutting room floor from this, um, which I was going to then develop into the complete system, um, which will begin with this one, and then there'll be two other volumes dealing with the different types of magic to get you to the point where you're beyond 5.6. Mm -hmm. So this one is to get you to 5.6 in GDC. Yeah. Yeah. This is to get you beyond that. And again, it's all pagan because the ideal I, problem I have with Abramelin is it's Christian. And I had a, I did the Abramelin and Thing. And one of the issues I had was, and in fact, I described this in the book, was it wasn't talking to me. I mean, the, the gods, everything else were doing it, but the system wasn't. I didn't believe in those particular beings in, in that way. I could sit and talk to ours, to Hermes, or some, some other god um, in a pagan sense, but sitting there praying... Um, confessing my sins to a God who I didn't really believe in didn't seem to make much sense of to course, me. Of course, of course, of course. Well, I think we should underline, and you're saying that yourself, I think in the introduction to Helios, uh, you were saying that when you use the word pagan, um, one normally immediately thinks about paganism in the more um, Nordic tradition. And of course, you're talking about the more Greek Roman tradition when you mention were pagan of course the term is absolutely correct but in people's imagination pagan sometimes is more nordic than what you actually mean is that right yeah probably i mean my yeah. my, my thing is um i had to find a word to describe non monotheistic yeah exactly religions. exactly yeah i mean heathen i think i i always said heathen with northern traditions and pagan with the mm -hmm. uh, with the uh, greek and roman and egyptian yeah. Yeah. Um, and reality is they weren't. They were just religions. Um, yeah, exactly. and nobody, really, nobody really thought of it. But what I think might hack off pagans when um, when they read my book is that I tend to go for the um, the god that's looking, one god that's looking within. Mm. Although it's, it's a triad, but it, it's ultimately it's one being looking in it inside itself, rather than lots of little gods i don't think that 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 didn't do anything for me i tried it it just absolutely absolutely um one final question well you are now in your mid 50s i believe and um you have started at about 17 you say to to work seriously in that direction so you got another half of your adult life to continue in that path so where in 20, 25 years from now, ideally, as a as a, an occultist, as a magician, as whatever you want to call it, would you like to be? Where would you like to go from here where you are today? I think um, I will car carry on experimenting with whatever I get given. Mm. I, have, I think the way I work now is I get an inspiration, I work on it, I develop it. I have no idea where it's going to take me because if you'd asked me 20, 30 years ago, where would I be now? Um, I would not have picked this. I would have not have thought, even had thought of this mm. because it's just not, um, 
the the magic I'm doing now is so different from what I was doing 40, 30, 40 years ago, 30 years ago. I'm not that old yet. Um, and I think I can, I wouldn't, I'd hate to be able to think I could predict that I can see what it's going to look like in the future because I, I really don't. All I can think is that it's going to be different and it's going to be new. And that's all, all I can safely say. Yeah, well, I think that's a good final phrase, isn't it? <laughs> well, Nick, thank you. That was great, a great hour in your company. Thank you for giving us the time and thank you for opening so many ideas and new thoughts for us. Um, I wish you the best of luck with Helios. Uh, I will make sure that when it will be released uh, publicly that I'll make sure people will know. And in the meantime, everybody should go on the Thought Hermes website and use the show notes links there to your website, to your other projects. Thank you so much for being with us today. Well, thanks for listening. You can
a very enjoyable interview with Nick Farrell, followed by Laugh and Psyche, performed and written by The Butterfly Wheel. I can only testify that Helios Unbound is really a very interesting work with highly interesting and also original versions of Ritual and tracing a very productive path. Watch out for this book to be released in a few months, not to miss. I would also like to remind you once again to go and see the show notes to find more detail about Nick and his work. Lots still to discover. Before we close this episode, and I tell you about our next episode here, I would like to make a little announcement which is not entirely new to those of you who are subscribed to my Facebook or Twitter channels. I will, next to Talk Thermis, start a new, a second podcast sometime in early 2020, probably in February. And this one is, will be going by the name of Thanatonauts. This name comes from Thanatos, the Greek god of death, and Nautis, explorer. And Thanatonauts, that podcast, will explore the realm of death as a sociological, theological, mystical, popular and cultural phenomenon. Thanatonauts is going to talk with high respect about death cults in different cultures and religions, near-death experiences, emotional, biological and language aspects, life extension, fear of death, etc, etc. So, if you're interested, and I hope you will be, you can go on Facebook and find the link over from the Thoth Hermes page to the Tanatonauts page. You like it there and you will be kept up to date. Thank you. Back to Thoth Hermes now. Our next episode is already number 12 of this season and this means it will be its last one. Our guest in the episode will be Thomas Prower and the subject we treat is in fact also death, but alongside his new book Morbid Magic. This episode will be made available in two weeks on November 17 and after that, well, another Ex Libris episode on November 24. And finally then, on the first day of December, we will start Season 4. If you want to know who will be with us on the opening episode of the new season, you have two options. Wait until November 17, or become a patron by subscribing on Patreon. Thanks for being with us today. Have a nice time until the next show and stay safe. Our intro music softly started in the background and I say, take care, stay tuned, hear you soon.